A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Our cases this week, a true monster has been convicted and sentenced to death for the murder of a little girl and her babysitter. On the day of sentencing, the killer elbowed his attorney in the face while shackled in the courtroom. After that performance, the judge hit him with the maximum. But first, It was a friend's trip to Myrtle Beach to celebrate graduation from high school. Among the friends was an on-again, off-again couple who have been friends since they were in elementary school, a relationship that friends say was filled with domestic violence. And so a trip planned to celebrate a new beginning ended with murder. Police say he killed her, and after allegedly strangling her, He sat with her body, both of them just 18 years old. We are recording this on Wednesday, July 5th of 2023. Our guest today is Luis Bolaños, a former homicide investigator with more than 30 years of law enforcement experience, a private investigator, founder of Get Bit Investigations, and a tireless advocate for the survivors of crimes. Luis, welcome back. How are you? Hi, and I'm doing great. Hopefully, I know you are too. Uh, it's thank you again. I, I, I love discussing these type of cases with you because there's so much information we can glean from these for future cases and investigations. But uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. I was telling you before we started recording that I dropped your coffee mug this morning. <laughs> oh. I'm showing it to everyone. It's forget it. I dropped it filled. I hadn't even had a sip of coffee yet. The whole thing collapsed. And of course, there wasn't enough coffee for my tummy. So I'm just using it without a handle. Well, you're committed. Thank you. Uh, I know the factory, <laughs> the guy that runs the factory. We'll, we'll get you another one. Mm-hmm. No worries. There's something about me and mugs between this one and the true crime daily mug that explodes. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That one, too. <laughs> that one, too. Yeah, that one too. Oh, dear Lord, dear Lord. All right. Well, let's get to these cases. They're horrific as usual. Um, Gosh, the thing about the first case, Lewis, the reason I wanted to talk about this one is because the two people involved are so young. They're just 18 years old. And and to have such a uh, dysfunctional and reportedly violent relationship so young into their dating world is yeah. what troubles me. Yeah, I, I agree, Anna. And that's one of the first things that caught my attention because I just it just seems so preventable, right? And I, this is really a story, a, a common story of an ongoing domestic violence history. And there were so many flags that we're aware of that went public. And there's probably many, many more in this situation that never went public. At what point could have somebody intervened and, and tried to address this? Yeah, uh, and young people, you know, they're still figuring out how to maneuver in life, how to express their emotions and deal with relationships. It's not easy. Those of us many decades older than that, we are still working and struggling through how do we express our boundaries? How do we say to people, no, you don't, you cannot treat me this way. You cannot say these things. It is, it is something that, that we all work on no matter what our age. But I just think when you're 18 years old, you have less knowledge you have fewer resources yeah well you're there are fewer resources out there but as you know um i'm an advocate for many victims of these type of crimes sexual horrible assaults physical assaults for and i do a lot of work with pave promoting awareness victim empowerment and a lot of what we do in in the pave organization to like many other organizations across the country is we offer education for Kind of kids of all ages, mm. right? And to yeah. all schools. And I don't know if they ever had that opportunity, not just these two kids, the, the, the suspect and the victim in this. I keep calling them kids, they're kids, they're 18. Um, but to see the flags, it may have been huge flags to for someone to intervene early and 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 the end goals to prevent this. Absolutely. All right. So let's get to the details here. The first case is out of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, where a teen, I mean, we're saying a teen, but really 18 years old is considered a legal adult. But in the world of reality, an 18 year old is still a very young person, a very young adult. 
So this 18 year old is accused of murdering his ex-girlfriend, who is also 18. They were on a senior trip to celebrate high school graduation. Everything is supposed to be fantastic. This is the best summer of your life. Right. Right. And those trips are very common, right? And I think it was post graduation, right? It was yeah, post graduation, exactly. Right? And that's I, I remember we had one of those trips, uh, pre graduation and post, right? You go to your local beach, and you know, and you're so happy that summer. You're happy I to celebrate. That summer. So yeah. happy before everybody takes off for school or whatever they're going to do. It's just yeah. a magical, magical time. So, you know, they take off on this trip. This was not a trip that was sponsored by the school. The right. group Very of kids important. just decided to get together and, and go to Myrtle Beach. OK, right. they're all adults. These, it's fine. These trips are never sponsored by or condoned by the schools. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> right. You have to stand there in the uh, gymnasium. That's about as good as it gets with a disco ball yes, and a DJ on an iPhone. <laughs> right. All right. So again, not a sponsored trip. This is a group of seven from Ohio who had planned this on their own. They had graduated from high school in Duncan Falls, Ohio on May 26. So according to a friend of the victim, Blake and Natalie, let's let's give let's name everyone here. Police say that 18 year old Blake Linkus strangled his ex-girlfriend, Natalie Martin also 18, while the two of them were on this trip. So according to a friend, Blake and Natalie had allegedly been friends since the two of them were 11 years old. And then, and both of them described very athletic in school. Natalie played softball and soccer. Blake played football and wrestled. Very typical teens. Natalie and Blake began dating about three years ago. So about the beginning of high school. And the pair reportedly broke up this February. And according to several news accounts, it's because friends claim that Blake had become violent toward Natalie while they were at a party and that he allegedly picked her up and threw her across the room at this house party. And that's when Natalie ended things, as she should have. As she should have. But what's interesting, again, like we talked about earlier, I, you know, I don't see anything anywhere in everything that I've been able to read on this case where somebody reported that instance or stepped in somehow to to understand what they were seeing at that time. They just kind of let it go. So bad enough to do that in private. But when you feel protected enough that you can do it in a certain social circle in front of people without any retribution, without having to be held accountable, there's something wrong with that. And of course, as you and I both know, that wasn't the first time. It couldn't have been. It's very unlikely. It's very unlikely. I think what we see a lot in domestic violence with uh, abusers who are maybe just a little bit older is that the abuser learns to hide and control it in public true and then unleashes in private yeah good point not right. always but we see that a lot right oh they were the perfect couple oh is out blah 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 yeah yeah but no. you know again and we don't know the circumstances of all of this obviously uh it is troubling obviously it's very troubling but what's more troubling well, what's equally troubling, I should say, is that it appears that, um, you know, they some whether they were in a relationship or not, they apparently at the very least remained friends because they take this trip together. Right. Right. They're in the same room. Right. And they're in the same room. Makes me think right. they're more than friends. Right. Yeah. You're going to tell me that's the only room that Natalie could have slept in um, yeah. in the vacation rental. Right. No, no, they, they were working on it, working on it at minimum, but at least for that weekend, they came to an agreement. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, Blake um, had, was the one who tried to patch things up with Natalie, according to friends. This is after the incident in February. And so we believe that the things were patched up to a degree. It is very unclear, again, how they ended up in the same room. And presumably the friends that were on this trip maybe would have known something about what happened at that February house party. Maybe not. We don't know. We can't possibly know that right now. So here is this is all from the what's been reported to several news organizations by people who were there or friends of Natalie. Apparently, the two of them had a fight the day before she was killed because Natalie was texting another man. Well, that could mean a million things. Yeah. 
but by itself upset Blake. He was upset and they had to work that out. That was an issue for him. Um, right. No matter what. And as you said, it could be a million things, but maybe she explained it and not that she had to. And, mm-hmm. and they somehow they were able to, to work that out and continue on. Yeah, because apparently they settled things. And then so we're talking now about June 6 and the group decides to go to a club that night. All of them. Apparently, Natalie was not feeling well at the club. And so she went back to the vacation rental with Blake. OK, yeah. so at that point right there, they say she wasn't feeling well. But my first thought was, did she use that as an excuse to leave because she was uncomfortable with Blake there? Kids, maybe alcohol was involved more. Who knows? Right. But that may have been her uh, get out, get out of here card. Um, but we may never know. And if it was her get out of here card, she only got out of there because, well, Blake insisted on going with her. It's not he went with her. So, yeah, I agree with you. The I don't feel well is usually a good for I'm out of here. I, I need a break from this. This has to stop. This is my my only way to communicate. I need a break. Well, ends up the two of them go back and then two others from the group return around 1045. So they weren't out that long. Some of these kids friends reportedly had to enter the residence through the back because neither Blake nor Natalie was answering the front door. So I don't know right. if there was a code or there was a key. That to me is a little bit unclear. Right. It seems it like locked. it was locked. It seems like it was locked. And so they did what anyone else would do. They went to the back. Mm-hmm. And in that time, they heard three thumps while they were transitioning from the front to the back. Um, who knows what that was? But they heard uh, all of them say that they heard as it came back, the two that were at the front door, the friends heard three thumps. And they didn't know what to make of it, but they couldn't find any signs that anything was out of the ordinary. And one of the friends says that they tried the bedroom door where Blake and Natalie were staying. It was locked and all seemed quiet. So, you know, nobody's screaming, nobody's wrestling. There's no sign of anything. Right. Right. So it it very likely at the chance it's indicative of what happened in the room was already over. I think so, too. Yeah. Yeah. Because no one heard anything for hours. Right. Until Blake came out. Right. (sighs) So then the rest of the friends at this vacation rental um, finally all came home and everyone was asleep by 7 a.m. on June 7th. So that's where we are now, June 7th. According to witnesses around two hours later, that would have been 9 a.m. Blake came out of the room that he and Natalie were sharing He was bleeding, covered in blood, screaming frantically, Natalie's not waking up. Yeah. And and on Blake bleeding from his chest, they could see the blood. I read a few reports. Some of them said that he came out bleeding and some of them said that he had stabbed himself when he after he came out. Don't know which one, but why would he do that? And why would he have a knife wound in his chest at just at that point? Is he thinking ahead because he's had all night to sit in there and think about what he did? We'll get to that in a second. To a, a defense, a self-defense. Is he suicidal? These are all things that come into play later when the judge has to make some tough decisions. I think it's a possibility and a combination of all of those things. Yeah. I, I you know, the the stabbing yourself in the chest. You know, if you really want to kill yourself, there's other ways. Yeah. And and very common people that want to commit suicide are thinking about it. They have hes- hesitation cuts where they mm-hmm, just mm-hmm. commit. Or and he's so, just so yeah. angry with himself. We don't know. Or is True. he going to claim that Natalie stabbed him? Right. Well, if Natalie stabbed him and the last we heard that they were alive was somewhere maybe around 10 p.m. Yeah, that. That means he would have been bleeding for nearly, for what, 11 hours? Right, right. And that's not the case. I think this is that's not the case. Right, right. Yeah, that's not the case. So based on the accounts of those who were there and information that was very specifically shared with Fox's Nancy Grace, Blake was in the room with Natalie's body for hours before he stabbed himself in the chest and then revealed the crime scene to his friends. They, of course, call 911. They call the paramedics. Um, The friends 
say that once they saw what was going on in that room and they saw Natalie, they tried CPR, but she was already cold to the touch. Yeah. It just was, they could not revive her. She was cold and stiff. And and when I read, Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And when I hear that type of response, when you see someone you care about, you love on the ground there, who you, even though they're, though they're cold to the touch and they're stiff, rigor set in, you still try CPR. How many cases have we covered, Anna, when it's their close relative and they see, but they don't get involved in trying to do some type of life same procedure, right? And there's a reason they don't. They, these kids, I really believe, weren't involved in her death. They reacted normally. They did what any good human would do is try to revive their friend, even though it became obvious eventually it was, it was too late. Um, but th- that's an indicator on so many of these cases. Yes. And and none of the others here um, has been charged. Only right. only Blake has been charged. Police respond. EMS declares that Natalie is dead. There is no saving Natalie. So authorities say that Blake confessed to strangling Natalie after the argument. And Blake was then arrested and charged with murder on June 8th. So this this alleged confession is very interesting for a a number of reasons. We know a lot of times, even when someone, when police say that someone has confessed, sometimes that can be turned around in court at a later date. Right. Because of the situation under which he may have confessed, because this is what they're claiming. Do you think it has a greater chance of standing up in court because it's to the cops in real time there at the scene. I I, I do. I I think, and I think it's recorded to be a body cam and who knows what else they have. Um, So I I think that's part of any confession. You always have to beat that threshold, whether was it coerced, was it done under extreme pressure, whatever that outside pressure may have, may have been uh, from law enforcement. Um, or was it just a voluntary statement that was recorded? Um, and so I, I think it's this one's going to hold up, I believe, from what I've seen. Yeah. So sad. So Blake made his first appearance in uh, Myrtle Beach, and this was last week on, Jan- on June 29th. And he was granted a conditional $150,000 um, bond. What's interesting here is that it's a bond that he can make. Because, you know, you only have to put up like, what, 10%. So it's right. not so a lot. 50, he paid $15,000. $15,000. Yes, right. it is a lot of money. But what I'm saying is right. it's something that you can secure against your home, Absolutely. against a car, against, you know, assets, right. against many things. It's a very low threshold, Anna. Thank you. That's what I was yeah. going to say. Yeah. I think it's ridiculously low. Absolutely ridiculous. And his she mom. She is dead. Right, right. And her, her mom was very upset. And I, I, I don't agree at all with the judge's uh, decision because he has a lot of discretion there. And when he tried to validate as to why he was going to extend this $150,000 bond, his words, Third Judicial Circuit Judge Thomas Cooper Jr. said it at 150K, noting that there is nothing in his background that indicates he's a person of violence. Really? These are extremely painful and frustrating words for the family and any friends of the victim to hear. That's nonsense. Judge, did you not read the arrest affidavit? History of violence. I mean, I mean, that's subjective. Do you need 10 years? Do you need two weeks? What's the what's the problem here? Or say so, he doesn't yeah. have a criminal record. If what you're saying is and what you mean is he doesn't have a criminal record, that is one thing. And maybe right. he's going to say, look, those are allegations. They were never reported to the police. It is simply a story. He has afforded this ability to make bail. Yeah. Well, he's got the confession, whatever that means. So he's well, that's, you know, the judge said. The judge said one of the reasons he was setting bail so low was because he thought, in his opinion, in the judge's great opinion, that because the young man had confessed that he was actually trying to deal with this, trying to deal with this. She's dead. Yeah. And I I have to call BS on that, too. I'm sorry, Anna. He's telling this is a good kid who who knows what he did wrong. Is it taking responsibility and, and accountability for what he did? 
okay, if you're going to use that as some type of threshold, apply that at sentencing if we get that far. Um, but he sent him home under the condition that he would not fight extradition because uh, he's from Ohio and this happened Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, right? Yes. Um, and that he would wear a GPS monitor and that he would stay away from the victim's family, which is mm-hmm. some type of restraining order. We all know TROs are to some degree useless, if not more often than not, but they are necessary. Um, I, I, I just, and it, he's being released into the custody of his parents. How, what do you mean custody of his parents? He's 18 years old. You, you don't get to go home to mom and dad after you commit something like that. So I, I had a lot of issues with that. And I feel for the family and I, I read the mom's words and it's just no bad decision. Thank God nothing happened. Right. And he eventually was put back into custody a few weeks later, but yeah. Yeah. Very bad decision. It is a bad decision. It sends a terrible message about murder, taking a life, the issues of domestic violence among young people, you know, uh, it is, it is just, it feels like a very bad decision to me. And, and The parents of the victim have every right to say, hold on a second. Yeah. So not only do the kids in this need to take some domestic violence classes, but I think that Judge Cooper could take a few himself. That one pissed me off. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The judge back to school for the judge. Sorry. You know, I know this is a tragedy for all the families involved. Every single young person who was there, who was exposed to this, witnessed this, tried to save that girl's life. It is a tragedy. It is a tragedy for the school. Without question, the community will suffer. But no one, no one will suffer more than Natalie's family. Our next case is out of Cape Coral, Florida. And this made headlines because of the way the convicted child killer attacked his attorney in court, he shoved an elbow into the man's eye while he was still shackled and it was all caught on camera. His timing couldn't have been worse, really, because the killer was about to hear his sentence from the judge for the conviction for two homicides. Would he get the death penalty or not? You can kind of see where this is going now. Clearly, he is indicating to the judge he is neither remorseful, changed or really gives a flying F about another human being, especially the person standing there defending this piece of crap. Yeah, a- absolutely. And he he really is. And that that elbow to his counsel's face is just, this is what started this. He's egotistical. He's a narcissist. He's been diagnosed. Um, and this is still, even though he knows he's caught red-handed and he's about to be sentenced possibly to life or and or the death sentence. Well, one or the other, huh? He gets <laughs> oh, the death in sentence. Florida? Right? Yeah. Florida? Well, that's true. Who knows what'll work out? But yeah, it's still about power and control. He still has to feel that he's in control somehow. And he, you know, he called his defense attorney over in uh, as Horrible. if he wanted to whisper something in his ear. And the defense attorney came over and leaned in. And that's when he took an elbow to the face, even as he was shackled. They, they readjusted those shackles after that. But uh, no, this guy deserves everything he got, not just for that, but as we continue, oh. what a monster. Oh, what yeah. a monster. What a monster. When we get into the charges and we get into his antics at trial, you know, we're using this video just as an example of, you know, we see two types of criminals in a courtroom. We see the one the ones who are, you know, very apologetic, they're a changed man, God has saved me. I hope God has saved you. But the reality is most likely, you know, God thinks you should be punished too, right? So we see right. those people, we see those people. All right, some of, and, and many times you all think it's an act. Then we see the ones who double down. <laughs> Down, and they're down. like, I'm going yes. kicking and screaming. And yeah. I believe that's their true selves. Absolutely. He, monster, he, monster, monster. OK, I want to get into the video um, and then we'll get into the case of, of really the man is a monster. And we're going to play this video. And so for those of you who are listening, Lewis has described it and we're going to describe it in more detail for those of you listening, those of you who can see it. It says it all. It says it all. OK, so the convicted killer is in one of those orange 
jumpsuit. He's got his legs and his hands chained, but the hands are not handcuffed together. So I want you to think of his arms as wings because you're probably saying, well, how did he elbow the guy? So just think of the arms as wings shaped like wings tucked in. And and that's how the jab happened. So um, he calls over his attorney, as you said, The attorney literally leans into this killer, leans in, and that's when he gives him the elbow in the eye. Horrible. And, you know, he's got a guard on each side of him. They restrain him. And and it's interesting, Lewis, because when I think of prisoners and you see them walking in with the chains, you he he had enough mobility where he could get the elbow out. Yeah, uh, those are that's very common. That's mostly how they're shackled when they're brought to court prisoners inmates so they most of the time they'll have leg shackles on with just two ankles together then they have a separate thing called the waist chain it's a chain that goes around your waist and two sets of handcuffs on either side so you're absolutely correct you still gives you mobility this this way with your wings um so um very common that if they have discussions with the prosecutor they'll have motions if they think that the individual that uh, is being prosecuted is a danger to those in the courtroom, they will shackle him differently. And they have to be very careful how they do that because usually uh, they're dressed in a suit and tie. I'm surprised he was in a, uh, his prison outfit. But if they're in a well, suit sentencing, tie, right? Sentencing, true. Yeah. Good point. But if he's not, but they can shackle him under his clothing in a way with uh, uh, equipment that keeps him from being able to do anything. And they'll even put a taser on him where they can buzz him if he starts to misbehave. And, and sometimes they put those hoods on them, the ones that spit, right? The spit hoods, yeah. Yeah, all that stuff, right? And he had none of that, right? Why would he, he have a, stuff on him? I mean, because clearly his antics during the trial showed, even though he hadn't lunged at anyone, he certainly was threatening. Right, a- a- absolutely. Um, oh, my God. So so um, the amazing thing is that it appears that the attorney somehow because it was a good elbow in the sense, not good and proper, but it really it hit it landed. And so um, the amazing thing is the defense attorney appears not to have been hurt. And then he spoke with a reporter from Wink TV immediately after this in the hallway. So here's the interview with criminal defense attorney Kevin Shirley. I had no idea he was going to do something like that. Obviously, he's been planning on that, but. As he was going down, he said uh, he said he was sorry he missed. Oh, he's been cooperative with um, Mr. Hollner, Ms. Murray, and myself throughout the entire case. It's just, I mean, we've provided him with discovery. We've gone to see him and talked to him. Lewis, can you imagine the balls on this guy? As the attorney is going down, the killer says to him, geez, I'm sorry I missed. What, that you didn't take an eye out? Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see how... <laughs> I'm going to go there. We'll see how how big those those uh, testicles are when he lands in prison and they find out <laughs> what he did. I, I oh, yeah. Shrink up very quick. Sorry, yeah. we're going there, Anna, but this guy really, really. Right. Oh, uh, no, he is. Just, he yeah. is so disgusting. Uh, you know, he is so disgusting. So let's let's talk about the case. Let's talk about what he has been convicted of doing. And then the other antics that he did in the courtroom that were so horrible to the families of the victims. Again, constant victimization here. All right. So let's get into the details of this guy. 61-year-old Joseph Zeiler was found guilty of the 1990 murders of 11-year-old Robin Cornell and her mother's friend, Lisa Story, who was 32 at the time. She was babysitting the girl. The two... Remember, one of the victims here is 11. The two were sexually assaulted and suffocated with a pillow, say prosecutors. The murders occurred in 1990, but it wasn't until decades later in 2016 that DNA found at the scene was linked to Joseph Zeiler. The jury voted that he should be given the death penalty. Now, here's the background on the case. Okay, so Lisa's story was staying with Jan Cornell and her daughter, Robin. This is in Jan's apartment in Cape Coral, which is about 100 miles south of Tampa. This is at the time of the incident. The mother went to watch a game with her boyfriend. And so Lisa said, don't worry, I'll watch Robin. The mother, Jan, returns home, finds them both dead. So this is May 9th of 1990 
when Jan gets home, she finds Robin and Lisa dead, suffocated. The home was ransacked. According to investigators, again, they believe pillows were used to suffocate them too. Those two. <clears throat> investigators allege that Joseph sexually assaulted both victims. I'm not getting into the detail of where the semen was found because it's just too much to bear. It is too much to bear when we are dealing with a child. What you need to know is that his semen was found on both of their bodies and also around the bodies, his right. DNA on the bed, around the scene, everywhere, including a hair. Okay. That's enough because I am just, I can't say these words about a child. I can't. No, I, I understand. I, I just want to add when uh, the 11 year old Robin's mom came home, she, the front door was locked. She couldn't get in. And she it walked around to the side door, but at the front door, according to the affidavit, she heard footsteps inside. So there's a good chance this clown, this monster was still there. If the only footsteps possible and took off the back and, she, and how close was she becoming victim number three? Horrible. And then this case went cold. It went cold for decades. No idea who could have done it. Thank goodness. Of course they preserved the DNA evidence even though at that time we still were in the infancy of all of this. Thank goodness all of this was recovered and saved. Then this idiot, years later, like in 2016, he gets into some kind of argument with his son. And allegedly the, the report is that he shoots his son with a pellet gun. The, the son goes to the hospital. Police are called. They arrest this guy. You know, they charge the father. So in 2019, 2019, Joseph was convicted of assaulting his son with a pellet gun. And as a felon, you have to submit your DNA to the criminal database known as CODIS. And so when his DNA gets entered, what happens, Lewis? Hit, hit, hit. Case suspect has been identified. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And 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 then the, that starts the second wheel in motion, right? Now you start gathering, you tell the detectives what you have, you start, we got him. They feel very confident they got the right guy. But let's talk about him shooting his son. They were involved in some argument to tell you the kind of life this clown monster led. And what I read through the affidavit was that he took his pellet gun and he actually pointed it dead center mass on, at his son and nicked his heart after the shot, which sent his son obviously to the hospital. Why, is, why wasn't that attempt homicide? I don't know, whole other deal. But if it wasn't for that felony crime, because it was a felony, they automatically submit it to CODIS. And, you know, it's a big, it, it's a big argument in many states. And, and the prosecutor announced this at the, at the press conference, how important it was to enter these individuals who are arrested for felonies into CODIS. Um, not necessarily convicted, but if you're arrested for a felony, I, I'd just be happy if you're convicted to make it mandatory. Everybody in this country who's convicted for a felony should be entered in CODIS. You would have thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of crimes, cold cases, just like this solved. Um, and that's a hurdle we're still you know, trying to fight legally. Yeah. And of course it takes time because then it's an older case, but nonetheless, right. um, they they were going to prosecute him. There was no question about it. And this man, the avenue he chose to take in court was to claim that it wasn't him, obviously. And the fact, and the amazing thing is then he has his attorney standing up there and saying, no, you can't prove that he was there that day. Oh, and the DNA, even though the DNA is like 99.9% accurate. Oh. Like, oh, what did he say about the, the attorney said about the DNA? We don't think it's accurate. Yeah. Well, Anna, you, we've been involved, you and I, in cases where, and DNA has grown so much because you and I pay, pay close attention to it over the years. Uh, cases where I've seen it one in 300,000, then one in 2 million. That's one in 2 million that it's not him. Right. That means, it, right. This case is a number I've never even heard of in my life. Right. It's one in seven. I make sure one in 700 billion that it's him, that it's him, that it's him. So it's him. It's nobody else but him. 
Exactly. And right. But but, you know, that was their defense. Right now, how this man, because he is a narcissist, he insists on taking the stand in his own defense, but he does not help his case. And not that I really want him to help his case, frankly, because I want this man to be away for the rest of his life and Florida will do whatever it is that Florida does. So this man, I mean, honestly, he just nails his own coffin. He gets up there and he claims that that DNA is from um, a former sexual encounter from months earlier. And it says, says that, you know, the family, that they were pigs because they didn't wash their sheets. And that's why his DNA was still there. Yeah. Well, good luck with that, how that worked out for you. But it shows the narcissism again. And look, when the prosecu- when the defense announces that the prime suspect, they're, they're, the defendant is going to testify in the back room, they're celebrating. Yes, yes, and yes, especially this clown. This is the last person you want to put on the stand. Yet they did because... They had them. <laughs> they had no I mean, choice. How, how, how yeah. horrible is this? The mother is mm-hmm. sitting there in the courtroom and, you know, she's listening to this man, you know, say these horrible things and excuse me, there was DNA also involving the little girl. Yes, ma'am. So don't give me any that there was any, please. So, and then to call her a pig for not washing her sheet for months, please. That is bull crap. And then, then he flicks the bird to everybody. I'm like, really? And the victim's families are sitting right there. Are you kidding me? This is after the killer on the teeth thing. You knew where this was going the whole time. You knew where this was going. So finally, on May 18th, Joseph Zeiler was convicted of two counts of felony murder for the deaths of Lisa and Robin. The trial then entered a phase to determine whether he would face the death penalty. On May 24th, the jurors voted 10 to 2 in favor of the death penalty after five hours of deliberation. What the hell took so long? Really? Five hours? (laughs) Yeah, well, it's good. Sometimes if it comes back in an hour, then you're giving them an argument that you guys didn't consider all all the arguments. So, but yeah, I get it, right? They probably had a good idea where they were going to go before the, the jury did before they walked into the jury room. It's yeah, and people, yeah. and there are people who are either morally or religiously opposed to the death penalty, and that could account for the two who said, "No, that is, I am opposed to that. I don't believe in that." Okay, so yeah. that might have, that might have come out in void dire, right? When they were trying to, trying I would to think so. Jurors, I would hope, right? But yeah. Um, So we are now there's been a recent change in the law in Florida, which I was not aware of in April of this year of 2023. Now, the requirement is this, that only eight of the jurors need to agree to the death penalty. So you can have several people vote no on the death penalty. But as long as you get eight. That's amazing. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, So it's the lowest threshold in the United States when it comes to determining the death penalty. But of course, the judge has discretion on the sentencing. So if the judge disagrees in any of these cases, the judge has the ability to say, no, this is the sentence I am imposing. Generally, judges follow what juries vote on. Yes, ma'am. Generally, but it does happen. They do sometimes weave in there and say, nope, we're going to do this instead. Uh, Right. And so that is the day that he decides to elbow his attorney. You know what I say? No mercy. No mercy here. Zero. Zero. Well, this being a holiday week, we do not have comments. Will is allowed to have a day off. (laughs) I I, I do want to bring in what we talked about, tie this into. uh, uh, There's something you want to talk about, though. You're taking Will's time. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Back on Zeiler. Zeiler. Zyler. Zyler, thank you. On uh, Zyler. So Anna, you know, the thing that came resonates in my head over and over again as, as I was reading this case, you're talking about a 26-year-old cold case that is solved. And and why is it solved? Well, the biggest catalyst for that is that 26 years later, the evidence that was collected properly, and thank goodness, even though they didn't quite know about DNA talking 26 years ago and what is potentially capable of today where it's reached today it was collected so the first team collected it the second team 26 later 
put it in motion after they had somebody identified and continue the investigation. Fantastic. But it reminds, well, so first thing I want to say is for everyone out there who has a cold case in their life, it's a family, friend, member, you, you have to be the squeaky wheel. Contact law enforcement, whoever is in charge of that cold case, no matter how much time has passed, on a regular basis and make sure that the evidence that was collected as potential DNA is being submitted to CODIS, C-O-D-I-S, right? The, the DNA database. Um, because sometimes this stuff gets left on a shelf or the investigative agency will collect one item, many items, but only submit one. When in reality, there's a good chance some of the other items may have something on there. And t- DNA continues to improve. So you got to consistently stay on top of that. Be the squeaky wheel. In the case here with Joseph Zeiler, the mom of, of the of the victim, the 11-year-old poor victim, she stayed on them the entire time. And at the press conference, she made a comment that she was glad she wasn't arrested for stalking the investigators and the police chief um, because she stayed on it. So I, I think about that, and I think about the case that we covered on this show, on this program, Anna, of Mark Heimbaugh, right? This is a 30-year cold case. And this resonates with what could happen in this in Hambo's case, who's been missing for over 30 years. And the evidence was collected. And there's a chance that DNA may get to the point, if it's not there already, where that case can also be solved. It gives hope to the mom who, when we, you interviewed her on this program, really pulled in my heart. And that will always stick with me forever. But cold cases... It, I, I personally think I say this all the time. There's no such thing as a cold case. There's the only cases that need more work and people that care. And in Joseph Zeiler's uh, instance, I think that's what he ran into. So yeah. there's hope. Yeah. And it's interesting that you 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 said something, and I, I don't always think of it in those terms about CODIS. I always think of the criminals and their DNA being put in CODIS. But I never think of the active part of investigators loading the DNA of their victims and what was found at the scene into CODIS to be able to get that match because that that match has to be made somewhere. Right. It it has to happen somewhere. So it, it didn't occur to me that there might be some cold cases out there in which investigators have not uploaded whatever evidence that they have. Yeah. And as you know, better than anyone else, Anna, it's not just getting a direct hit to the actual suspect. You That's even spread out wider. It could be familial. It could be a family member that helps focus the investigation in a certain direction, somebody in this family line. So it, it's a powerful tool that I still, that really to this day is so underused and the potential for it growing and really closing thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of cases is there. So I, I hope it gets the, the attention it deserves. Um, and I hope every felon and at minimum, every convicted felon has to mandatorily put his or her DNA into CODIS. Yeah, it, it is really helping. It is really helping. But because we talk about justice on this program a lot, it's all about justice. And if a case is unsolved, there cannot be any justice. And even when you do get a conviction, like with this man, what did it take to, you know, the antics in the courtroom, the disrespect, how foul he was, that experience was jarring to and and hurtful to the families because of how he conducted himself. So it's it's another injury. Right. But sadly, you have to get through that in order to finally get to justice and justice is so empty. So the man's away and maybe he'll be put to death. Maybe. But that little girl and that woman, they're gone. Yeah, it's it, it's so sad. Yeah, it is just so sad. Really, really sad. Well, Lewis, I'm so glad that you were able to join us today. You know, um, I, I know we usually we use comments to buffer us from ending on a really sad, sad note, um, trying to talk about other things. All I can add to like lift the spirit slightly is that I I finally got to see you in person last week in Denver, which is yeah, just I, I hadn't seen you in a year. And last time I saw you was like we were in Indiana and Ohio. <laughs> yes. Working another investigation, working right? Another investigation. Right? Almost a year to the day. But this time was no investigation in Denver. It was just simply dinner and an art show. (laughs) 
I, I can tell you, Anna, that since I left you in, in Denver, uh, I'm working and traveling, as you know. I am parked outside of the Grand Tetons uh, in Wyoming doing the podcast from here, and it's beautiful. I've just take, peek, taken a peek out my window here. Obviously, this is not my real room here. And just to make sure I don't have any more grizzlies come up to our front door and say hello. We've had a few nice run-ins here, but it's amazing. It's going to work from anywhere nowadays. Yeah. Uh, get things is. done. Get yeah. good things done. Yeah. Absolutely. Always a pleasure. Lewis, where can people find you or get in touch with you? Thank you, Anna. I'm at Get Bit Investigations. My entire social media footprint's on there. And it's a pleasure to be here and discuss crime with you as always. Thank you. Always a pleasure to see you, Lewis, in person or virtually. You can find me at Anna G News, Anna with one N. You can find this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel or receive our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. You can sign up. So until next time, I'm your host, Anna Garcia. This is True Crime Daily, the podcast. And as we always say, don't do crime.